Okay. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson School. I'm Cecilia Rouse. I'm the Dean of the Woodrow Wilson Zoom, and I hope you're having a wonderful afternoon. Today's talk, Hope, Compassion, and the Can-Do Spirit, President Sun Young Rees and Korea's Path for it Forward, will be delivered by Un Chong Chang, the former Prime Minister of the Republic of Korea from 2009 to 2010. In addition to serving as Prime Minister and in many other important government roles, Prime Minister Chung was a professor at Seoul National University from 1978 to 2009 and served as its president from July 2002 from July to July 2006. Prime Minister Chung's ties to Princeton are deep. He earned his PhD in economics here, a profession I know and love, under the direction of my colleague Alan Blinder, and he returned to Princeton in 2008 as a visiting fellow at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies, which many of you know as peers. And so we couldn't think of anyone more fitting than Prime Minister Chung to deliver the inaugural Syngman Rhee 1910, Class of 1910 lecture, made possible through donations collected by the Princeton Club of Korea. Prime Minister Chung reaffirms the strong Princeton-Korea ties that go back to, Prince, to President Syngman Rhee, the first democratically elected, democratically elected president of the Republic of Korea. From the close of, uh, from the close to 2000, 1000, I'm sorry, <laughs> of the nearly 100 Korean students who met with Prime Minister Chung last night, and to the strong Princeton alumni organization in Korea, to the faculty who are studying this important part of the world, Princeton understands just in how important the strong ties to Korea are. Welcome, Prime Minister Chung. Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be with you here today. Uh, more than 30 years have passed since I graduated from Princeton. I was a student in economics uh, in the early 1970s, between uh, 72 and 76. To me, that seems not too long ago, and there is still the young, aspiring student in me, and I'm very excited for this special opportunity to spend time with you here in that hall. Earlier this afternoon, we de dedicated Bowl 16 of Robertson Hall as the Shingman Lee Lecture Hall. The dedication was made possible thanks to the generous donation and efforts by many Kore Korean Princeton alumni and our friends and family in Korea and the United States. President Shingman Rhee was the first democratically elected president of the Republic of Korea. He holds a special place in many uh, Korean people's hearts. However, more so than his political accomplishments, uh, his life story as a patriot, educator, Christian, and visionary is what is truly inspiring. I want to share with you today who President Lee was and what we can learn from his ideas and actions. In doing so, I'd like to uh, ponder with you the next path forward for the youths of Korea, the US, and the world. You know, what the purpose of my talk is to show uh, who President Shing Man Lee was and what we can learn from his ideas and actions. Now, Shing Man Lee was born in 1875. According to writings by foreign diplomats, missionaries, and travelers who visited Korea in that era, the ruling Joseon dynasty was saddled with political, social, and systemic problems. The imperial court uh, was divided on whether uh, it should open the doors to incoming Western influence. The economy was dependent on an inefficient agricultural system that had yet to adopt industrialization. Failing to adapt to the changing geopolitical landscape, the 500-year-old five year Joseon dynasty was slowly losing its sovereignty to outsiders. 
for a proud people with 5,000 years of history and culture, it was a dark period. In 1896, uh, young patriots like Shingman Ri formed the Independence League to lead efforts to protect Korea's sovereignty. Ri was one of the key figures, and upon criticizing the Joseon Court and calling for reforms, he was jailed for life under sedition charges. Subject to physical and mental oppression, Ri became a Christian while under imprisonment and constantly prayed for the salvation of his soul and country. Although he faced a hopeless situation, he shared his faith with 40 other prisoners and helped them to convert to Christianity. He also created a library for inmates to educate them and also created an English-Korean dictionary. I understand this is the first English-Korean dictionary in Korea. In 1904, after being imprisoned for over six years, key members of the Joseon court recognized his talent and, and potential as an advocate of Korea's independence, and Ri was sent to the U.S. to appeal to President Theodore Roosevelt's administration to block Japanese imperial encroachment. Although he met with many prominent figures in Washington, D.C., Ri had little success as an envoy of a country that, from an outsider's point of view, didn't have any ability to fend off external aggression. It was during this period that Shingman Ri came to Princeton as a graduate student. At Princeton, Ri had the great fortune of meeting a friend and mentor, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson invited Ri to family dinners and told visitors of Princeton that Ri would one day lead Korea in regaining its independence. In 1908, a recommendation letter President Wilson wrote on behalf of, of Ri. Uh, Wilson stated that Ri had exceptional talent and character and was an expert in the political dynamics of Asia. Wilson praised his oratory skills and shared that Ri was a patriot who had much compassion for fellow Koreans <laughs> living in the US. Wilson concluded that whoever seeks to better understand the present and future of Asian <coughs> geopolitics should first and foremost uh, consult Ri. It seems Princeton has a gift for providing generous care and support for graduate students from Korea who need help finding the right future path. Just as President Wilson opened doors for President Ri, I had a mentor who supported me wholeheartedly. When I was about to graduate and didn't have very attractive job offers, uh, except for Bowdoin College and Federal Reserve New York. Uh, <laughs> 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 Professor uh, Blinder called me into his office to inquire what my future plans were. When I shared, I was in contact with the International Monetary Fund and Columbia University. He picked up the phone and called senior folks at IMF to say, if IMF doesn't give an offer to Unchan, he will go to Colombia. <laughs> then immediately, he called Colombia to say, if Colombia doesn't give an offer to Unchan, he will go to the IMF. <laughs> Professor Blinder hung up and then smiled at me. Not surprisingly, the following day, I had offers from both institutions. <laughs> and I asked Professor Blinder where to go, and he said, uh, what my uh, interest is, money or academic career. I said, academic career. He, he, he said, then naturally you have to go to Colombia. That's why I uh, chose Colombia and taught there for about three years, between 1976 and 78. With the help of friends in, Princeton in the Princeton community, in June 
1910, President Lee became the first Korean to be awarded a doctorate degree from Princeton University, not only from Princeton University, but also from any university in the United States, I guess. His doctorate thesis was titled Neutrality as Influenced by the United States, which pointed out lessons for Korea that could be, that could be taken from past US foreign policies. Despite this personal achievement, we didn't have a country to, to go back to as the Japanese imperial aggression led to the fall of the Joseon dynasty in 1910. For the next 35 years, we never lost hope that Korea will once again become an independent sovereign nation. Uh, the year before uh, last, we uh, recognized that it was the uh, 100th anniversary of Dr. Rhee's uh, doctoral uh, uh, dissertation, and we uh, gathered together in Princeton, a Korean chapter of Princeton Alumni Association gathered and uh, decided to raise some funds to contribute to Princeton University in honor of uh, Dr. Lee. In 1919, he participated in forming a provisional government in exile of the Republic of Korea in Shanghai and was nominated by his peers as the first president. In Hawaii, he organized the youth to better educate them and to, pre to prepare them for the day when Korea will be an independent uh, contributing member of the international community. During World War II, we had foresight of the insatiable Japanese imperial aggression. He warned of a looming US-Japan conflict in his book, Japan Inside Out, which was published months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. He also saw communism as a greater threat than totalitarianism and refused to allow communists into the Korean uh, provisional government in exile. He really disliked communism. Uh, I mean, he, uh, as I said, he thought communism is a greater threat than totalitarianism in Korea. Korea regained independence in 1945 following the end of World War II. Unfortunately, the Cold War immediately set in and Korea was divided into North and South Koreas. In the southern half of the peninsula, the Republic of Korea was founded in 1948 under the auspices of the United Nations. The only but significant blemish to this momentous achievement was that elections could not be held north of the 38th parallel. President Lee was sworn in on July 24, 1948 as the Republic of Korea's first president. As with all public figures, President Lee's legacy is subject to debate. He is credited with pushing through reforms in land ownership that broke the economic chokehold large, large landowners had against the powerless tenant farmers. These reforms became a foundation for Korea's market economy. He also adopted the compulsory education system where children from all classes and regions in Korea were trained by a high quality modern curriculum. The educated workforce became a springboard for economic and social development in the new republic. In 1950, the Korean War broke out when USSR-backed Kim Il-sung of North Korea invaded South Korea. During three years of devastating warfare, over four million people were killed or wounded. The infrastructure of the economy was severely destroyed. Seoul was almost completely burnt to ashes. Orphans and refugees roamed the cities and the countryside searching for their lost loved ones. Malnutrition and disease were everywhere. 
If these, in these desperate times, President Lee reached out to the U.S. and United Nations and was able to secure the assistance of key allies. The military alliance between the U.S. and Korea was and still is a bedrock for political stability in North Asia. I would say uh, mutual defense treaty between the U.S. and Korea has been a vital force in uh, uh, Korean economic growth and social development. In spite of these accomplishments, a blemish to his record was that he did not rel relinquish power after being in office for almost 12 years. In the spring of 1960, students and citizens demonstrated and called, called for his resignation. Rather than oppressing these demonstrations by force, he decided to step down in April 1960. I was, uh, I was the uh, first year student of junior high school. At the time, I still remember what, has been, what uh, happened uh, in April 1960. Up to now, there is an ongoing debate regarding whether one should focus on his life as a whole or focus on how he ended his, his political career. For me, I believe we need to commemorate President Lee's dedicated service to his country and humanity, and at the same time, take valuable lessons from his actions towards the end of his political career. As we look back, President, President Lee's life, I'm struck by how open-minded and cosmopolitan he was, coming from an Asian feudal kingdom and immersing himself in the U.S. education and democratic socio-political system. I'm touched by how uncompromising he was to his faith and love of his country. I sincerely hope that these admirable characters and traits of President Lee can be emulated and then exceeded in the lives of those students and scholars who will go in and out of Shingman Ri Lecture Hall. Once again, I sincerely hope that these admirable characters and traits of President Ri can be emulated and then exceeded in the lives of those students and scholars who will go in and out of Shingman Ri Lecture Hall. Due to the devastation of the Korean War, Korea's GDP per capita in the late 1950s was 101st of 125 nations. But in 2010, Korea's per capita GDP, when converted into purchasing power, is on par with the average of per capita GDPs of uh, EU nations. Korean economy is now the 13th largest around the globe with a, uh, with, with a 1 trillion US dollars of GDP. In addition, now Korea is among the only seven countries in the world which have the population larger than 50 million and at the same time a pro capita GDP higher than 20,000 US dollars. Now, the per capita GDP of Korea is 23 uh, US dollars. We are now trying to reach uh, 30,000 US dollars uh, sooner or later. Uh, young Koreans now have showcased their talents in the recent London Olympics, and Korean songs are sung by youths around the globe. Now, Isn't it true? <laughs> How then did you get here? Many studies have been conducted on this topic, but I would like to share with you a few that stand out for me personally. First, we had great friends who cared in response to the UN Security Council Resolution 84 16 countries came to South Korea's aid during the Korean War. 
young men and women from these far-flung lands came and shed their, shed their precious blood, blood to defend the country they never knew and the people they never met. The proud flags representing these 16 countries fly daily at the war memorial of Korea in Seoul to remember those courageous soldiers. After the war, our allies and the UN lent a valuable hand in rebuilding our war-torn nation. Currently, Korean agencies and corporations are conducting diverse humanitarian projects in all corners of the, of the globe to reciprocate the generosity and goodwill that we as a nation received from our dear friends around the world. Let me reiterate that. Uh, currently, Korean agencies and corporations are conducting diverse humanitarian projects in all corners of the globe to reciprocate the generosity and goodwill that we as a nation received from our dear friends around the world. <clears throat> Second, a focus on education and investment in human capital was critical. With no significant natural resources or accumulated capital, Korea had to rely on a highly educated workforce to drive economic growth. Passion for education has a long uh, heritage in Korea. A famous anecdote will help you to understand Korean people's attitude toward education. It involves a 16th century scholar, Sokbong Han, who is recognized as the best calligrapher of the Joseon dynasty. Han's mother, despite her desire to keep her son at her side, sent Han to a temple in the mountain so that he could focus on learning calligraphy. Some years later, still young and un unmotivated, Han came back home one day announced to his mother that he no longer wished to pursue his calligraphy studies. Although Han's mother was delighted to see her son again, she was determined to see him finish his education. His mother, who was supporting Han by selling rice cake in the marketplace, proposed a contest to Han. They would turn the candlelight off, and if Han could write calligraphy, better than she could slice the rice cake in complete darkness, then he could do whatever he wanted. When they turned the candlelight back on, Han's calligraphy was totally at best, while each piece of sliced rice, rice cakes by his mother boasted perfect form and size. Realizing that his mother used to work in the dark, to save money to provide for his education, Han returned to the temple, determined never to come back home until he became the best calligrapher in Joseon. I myself had numerous helpers and mentors who allowed me to fulfill my academic uh, pursuits. I was born in Gongju in South Chungcheong province, and during my elementary school days, my family couldn't afford even my lunches. My mother worked at a hospital washing clothes to support my siblings and me during the tough post-war years. She kept reminding me, reminding me of her confidence that a bright future awaited me so that poverty may not discourage me. I worked as a tutor since I was in middle school all the way through college to earn tuitions, but I never neglected my own academics. Besides my mother, I had others who imbued me with confidence throughout my youth. They all had a passion for education. Without the conviction of my supporters and professors, my academic path from Gongju to Seoul to the United States and myself of today wouldn't have been uh, possible. The third factor for Korea's rise is the can-do or fighting spirit of the Korean people. Uh, so, some people call it a hungry spirit of the Korean people. 
During the rapid industrialization process, many Koreans worked tremendously hard to help themselves, their families, and the communities uh, climb out of poverty and build the foundation for a market-driven society. Wherever there were jobs, our young men and women went to faraway countries to take those opportunities. In the 1960s, Koreans went to West Germany to work as coal miners and nurses. Impressed with the Korean work ethic, the West German government was one of the first friends to extend to Korea industrial development loans. In the 1970s, with the construction boom in the Middle East, many Korean construction workers helped to build key infrastructure and development projects in the region. The wages these workers earned and sent back home allowed their families to send their children to college. With such positive achievements, where should Korea go from here? Better yet, as all of us in this room face the uncertainties and challenges of the 21st century, what are some core values that could lead us to a more fruitful future? I would like to propose a few modest ideas that can be summed up as the three mores, more open, more confident, and more compassionate. First, we should be more open. I want to underscore the importance of education in creating open minds. John Locke, the great philosopher during the Enlightenment period, I mean uh, the 17th century, uh, said, education begins the gentleman, but reading good company and reflection must finish him. Uh, John Locke, uh, in his book, uh, some thoughts concerning education uh, suggested a lot of things about uh, what to teach, how to teach, and uh, from when to teach. Uh, it, it's a very impressive book. As soon as I became president of Seoul National University, I read that book, and it, it helped me a lot uh, when I uh, administered Seoul National uh, University. In the past, it was OK for young people of any country to live all their lives in their own countries and expect to understand issues of the world. However, the problems we now face regarding our environment, energy needs, and global financial system are too complex and require multinational cooperation. To accomplish this, we need facilitators who can go beyond borders. We must all try to go out and visit foreign lands, interact and debate with peers from different countries, and touch, feel, and taste various cultures. If we have a chance to study or, or work overseas, meet peers from or in other nations, or volunteer in foreign lands, I strongly urge you to do so. Just as in the early uh, 1900s, Shing Man Ri boarded a steamboat headed for the United States, I urge all of you to take the leap. <clears throat> in various corners of the world, we are currently facing religious, ethnic, socio-political challenges. We can all easily fall back to our comfort zones and draw lines that separate us from them. However, if we become more open and try to focus on finding common grounds rather than battlegrounds, we can funnel our creativity and energy to solve the world's issues. Secondly, we need to, we need to be more confident. Korea is no longer a hermit kingdom dislocated from the global community. Indeed, Korea is a dynamic market economy. I would say it's one of the most dynamic economies in the world. Uh, Korean pop groups have fans all over the world, and Korean TV dramas and movies are enjoyed 
by our friends in hundreds of countries. Korean food and fashion is sought out by friends all over the world. Korea needs to channel this new confidence for the promotion of prosperity, peace, and stability in North Asia and the globe. We must be wise and patient as we try to open up North Korea to the global community. We must work with our neighboring countries in helping North Korean refugees who have fled North Korea but have no standing and protection in the international community. We must also work together to resolve legacy issues. We must also work together to resolve legacy issues. Every Wednesday, in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul, a crowd gathers peacefully to call for Japan's change. This crowd is made up old ladies who were forced to become involuntary comfort women, old gentlemen who were subject to forced labor and were not compensated by the Japanese corporations during World War II, and youths from Korea and Japan who support and remember them. If we do this, we will be able to pave the way for the young generations, for the young generation to work together to create a much better future. I strongly believe one must face history with truth and objectivity. However, I'm disturbed at the approaches taken by governments in China and Japan in teaching a revisionist view of history to their youths. I sincerely hope we can solve these legacy issues together amongst the North Asian countries. Last but not least, we must be more compassionate. The, the neoliberal economic system, which has been prevalent in the global economy since the 1990s, is known to bring efficient economic growth. For this system to function, however, economic benefits must be shared amongst various constituents. Unfortunately, in Korea, this has not been happening in recent years. Small group of people have come to monopolize the wealth and income distribution of the economy has de de deteriorated. The rational market, by its very nature, is not concerned with social ju justice and fairness. Capitalism should be rooted on sound ethics, but the Korean economic system for the last couple of decades was not focused on ethics. After suffering the ramifications of the global financial crisis, uh, people who were not fortunate enough to maintain previous standard of, of living have started to question the reason of being of the neoliberal economic system. That must be true here uh, if you take a look at uh, the demonstrations uh, against the Wall Street. I believe Korea's economic system needs to be more compassionate. While the mishaps of the financial conglomerates were at the center in the United States and Europe during the recent global financial crisis, corporate conglomerates or chevals are at the center in Korea. Since the launch of the government-led economic development plans 50 years ago, chevel companies admittedly have served vital roles in contributing to Korea's economic growth. Nonetheless, in the neoliberal economic system, they have been amassing economic power, forcing irrational cost cuts or profit cuts on suppliers and entering sectors and industries that are better suited for small and medium-sized companies. Korea's small and medium-sized companies employ 88% of workforce and if these companies are not receiving their fair share of economic wealth, household income cannot increase as much as it should. 
from 1970 to 1998, from 1970 to 1998, both corporate earnings and household income increased at an annual average rate of 8%. From 2005 to 2010, on the contrary, corporate earnings increased by a spectacular 19% per annum, while the increase in household income stalled at 1.6%. In this type of, an, type of an economic structure, economic growth in itself wouldn't be able to provide solutions to stagnant household income, rising household debt, low domestic demand, and high unemployment rates. These problems can be solved only when entrepreneurs emerge to build and grow innovative, small and medium-sized enterprises. And those SMEs are given a fair chance to thrive, innovate, and produce profits. Aren't you tired? <laughs> Do you follow me? OK. Uh, when I got a job from Columbia in the early 19, in early 1976, uh, Mrs. Blinder and some other uh, people called me and uh, uh, asked me to say whatever I would say in, uh, in the future classes. I, I was trying very hard to explain some concepts in English, but uh, it didn't seem uh, they do not follow me. <laughs> so I just said, uh, do you understand me? Which is the direct translation of uh, 이해하십니까 in Korean, in Korean. Then Mrs. Bryant told me, you never say, do you understand me? You have to say, do you follow me? <laughs> or are you with me? So, that's why I'm saying, do you follow me? <laughs> <laughs> Since leaving the Korean Prime Minister's, Prime Minister's office in 2010, and until earlier this year, I led a commission on shared growth for large corporations and small and medium enterprises. The commission is a private organization that encourages large corporations to give back voluntarily to SMEs their fair share of profits or create a framework where innovation at the SME level can be rewarded. The Commission's activities, however, have repeatedly run into furious uh, resist resistances from several companies. The Commission has done a considerable amount of work, but there still remains more to be done. I hope that the Commission's activities will instill a compassionate mentality into Korea's economic system and serve as an innovative policy that catalyzes entrepreneurial activities in the uh, SME sector. <clears throat> My friends around the world, especially in developing countries, are calling on and looking to Korea to share the experiences and know-how that we have accumulated as we strove to climb out of economic hardship during the past uh, half century. In recent years, South Korea led initiatives, uh, especially during the G20 summit meeting in Korea two years ago, to enhance the international development aid model. In addition to assisting struggling countries with funds and materials or the hardware, Korea has also emphasized the provision of the software for economic development, such as strengthening public education, creating efficient economic development and infrastructure plans, and building social welfare networks. To those who share Korea's concerns regarding uh, economic polarization, weak domestic demand, insufficient number of jobs, and need for increase in entrepreneurship, efforts of the Commission will hopefully serve as a good reference point. In the coming years, I hope to 
dedicate my efforts in promoting the sense of shared growth in Korea and beyond. Uh, lastly, why don't I introduce a famous poem. In 1929, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but Rabin Dranath Tagore, the great poet and writer of India, wrote a poem that inspired many Koreans who were subject to brutal colonial rule, rule, colonial rule. It was titled, The Lamp of the East. In the golden age of Asia, Korea was one of its lamp bearers. And that lamp is waiting to be lighted once again for the illumination in the East. In the future, I strongly hope and know that Korea will make our past, present, and future friends proud by, by being the brightly lighted lamp of the global community, always willing and able to lend a helping hand to friends in need inside and outside the country. With that, I would like to conclude my speech today. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you.